want to see the live thing yet. Alright. Now we are back in business. And uh, I hope that you are able to hear us. There we go. So you guys should be able to hear us now. Should be back in business. Um, we just wanted to uh, update you on Tuesday through Facebook Live like we have been doing for a while. This is the first time I was thinking the three of us have been together in a while, right? So it's been like two or two or nobody, and so now the three of us are here. Um, and just uh, yeah. <coughs> by way of Amy quick now. announcement. We're good. Oh, yeah, so Amy says we can hear you. Fantastic. Thank you for the feedback. She, says, says, no. she says we can hear you. So, um, so what we want to do, uh, just by way of announcement quickly, so this Sunday, uh, Equipping Hour is um, going to be transitioning to our normal scheduled program, so we'll be starting our church history class, I'll be teaching that. Uh, we're going to look at the time of Christ, uh, the time before Christ came in. Um, so going back several hundred years, uh, even talking about people like uh, Mark Antony, Cleopatra, um, the Maccabean Revolt, and how all of these things came together to actually make it the perfect time for God to send Jesus. And then since we're talking about the church, we'll go Pentecost and then and then continue on for the first 300 years of church history. So um, we're going to look at the first, uh, you know, the first church and what they did and what they looked like. We'll go in depth with that. So we look forward to that on Sunday. But do you guys have any announcements? Anything going on at all? Nothing going once. Uh, we have the notes available for the last two adult equipping classes if you uh, that I did on Black Lives Matter and the social justice movement. So if you're interested in those, I'll try and attach those to an email today, or you can just email us at church and we can get you a copy of those. But thanks for your interest in those topics. Cool. So for today, <coughs> we uh, uh, just wanted to let you guys in on... Uh, maybe you hadn't heard, or maybe you had heard. Um, one of the uh, one of the great uh, heroes of the faith on Friday the seventeenth uh, finished his race and went home to be with the Lord, and that would be Dr. J. I. Packer. Um, and while he wasn't in the same vein uh, as we would be, as far as denominational wise, and even a few uh, um, you know secondary beliefs wise he certainly uh, has influence and will continue to influence evangelicalism uh, until until it's all said and done his books will be around most likely forever and ever um, but I just it, if you didn't know I just you know between the three of us we probably have one page worth of biography <laughs> for J.I. Packer um, certainly read some of his books but uh, don't know a ton about him so I just I just went online and wanted to share just a few uh, things with you. Born in 1926 in England, ended up immigrating to Canada, uh, became one of North America's uh, leading evangelicals. Um, and uh, when he was a young kid, I think he was seven years old, got hit by a bread truck. And if you ever watch J.I. Packer, you see his face. Uh, it wasn't um, symmetrical, and he actually, just, his whole head was put back together. Um, some people have said kind of like, uh, you know, a puzzle pieces that the, the doctor had to do. And so because of that, he couldn't play sports and he really wanted to. But instead of that, he got into, uh, became a, an avid reader and writer. I think his 11th birthday I read, they got him a typewriter. And so from then on, he, he became uh, very prolific at both reading and writing. He became very interested in the Puritans. So he was heavily influenced by the Puritans. In fact, John Owen's uh, Death of Death. Uh, became kind of his mantra uh, that he uh, he lived by, um, and then uh, with that, he and Martin Lloyd Jones they were contemporaries. Uh, Martin Lloyd Jones also avid Puritan reader. Uh, they started the Puritan Conference, and for 20 years they met uh, to to host the Puritan Conference. And um, because of uh, J.I. Packer's belief uh, ecumenicalism, so. He signed a, a pact, if you will, with uh, the Catholic Church. So he was Anglican, and he signed to be brothers in arms, basically, with the Catholic Church. Uh, Lloyd-Jones sent him a letter and said that because of this, we can no longer um, be partners. And uh, after that moment, I think it was 1970, don't quote me, though, and uh, they decided to no more, to no more meet together, uh, no more uh, conference. Uh, they still had immense respect for each other, but he was no longer... Um, in the same kind of group, what Martin Lloyd-Jones has called the uh, Free Church, I believe. 
So he had a little bit of uh, controversy. Um, the last great event, uh, with his death, I would say, is kind of the ending of an era. Um, and they had uh, the Chicago Statement on Biblical Inerrancy. Maybe you've heard of that, 1978. Um, I just grabbed some of the names that had signed it. Maybe you've heard of James Montgomery Boyce, W.A. Criswell, both John MacArthur and his father, R.C. Sproul, Francis Schaefer, um, and J.I. Packer. And so it was uh, 200 pastors who signed this to, to uh, um, show their, their belief in uh, the biblical, uh, inerrant biblical uh, belief uh, for all of evangelicalism. And so as he dies, and we know Sproul died, and you know men like John Stott died, and in the 80s you had Lord Jones, and so these men are all dying off, and you see this kind of end of, of mainstream, um, kind of that powerhouse of, of evangelicalism. So um, Dr. Packer was known as a prolific writer, as I said, and I just grabbed a few of his books maybe you've heard of. Um, certainly not going to name all of them. We don't have enough time. But uh, Knowing God is probably his most popular. It was uh, written in the 70s, I believe and uh, kind of got him on the map. Um, and it was the first book I read by him, and I read it many, many years ago. And then we also had, and I do have it here, I grabbed it, so Knowing God, if you guys could see that, I'd highly recommend it. Um, it's a great book on, well, Knowing God. God. <laughs> so, uh, super, super great book. I've handed it out to people in the past. Um, also, Concise Theology is kind of, uh, it's not a full-on systematic theology like you would get with Biblical Doctrine or something like that. Um, but it, uh, it certainly gives you um, the systematics in a concise way. Um, and then he had his uh, writing on the Puritans was also quite impressive. Uh, one of his, one of his uh, most popular is called Among God's Giants, Aspects of Puritan Christianity. And then lastly, actually his second book ever published is one we're going to talk about today. It was published in uh, 1961. And it's called Evangelism and the Sovereignty of God. If you can see that, uh, Todd has a, another one um, with a different cover. It's been reprinted several times. Uh, it's in a classical series. Uh, it certainly has made impacts across denominational borders. As Mark Dever, the avid Baptist, has written uh, the foreword for the Anglican uh, J.I. Packer. And so we wanted to take a minute and just talk about what that means. What does evangelism and the sovereignty of God mean? So not necessarily going to walk through this book, but we're certainly going to take some concepts from it, and we're also just going to talk about what that looks like in our life practically uh, as believers. And so we're going to start out with divine sovereignty. And so uh, I've been doing all the talking thus far, and so these guys are going to pick up some slack here uh, for the next, you know, 15, 20 minutes uh, as we talk about that. So uh, first of all, we're going to start with divine sovereignty. So you guys want to define that for us? What does that mean? Maybe, um, Joe, you can do that, but maybe before we get into that, maybe just highlighting the struggle here that uh, most of us as believers wrestle with the concept of if God is electing people unto salvation, then what does that do to evangelism? Then why evangelize? Mm. If God's already determined it, if it's already fixed, if, if that's already settled in heaven, who's going to be, become a Christian, then why in the world do we need to do evangelism? Um, it just seems like this kind of fatalistic, it's already figured out, so we don't need to be about it. So I think the question that comes up so many times in um, you know, our, our circles, those of us who love the doctrine of election and God's sovereignty, is how does this um, square with our evangelistic enterprise? So I think that's the, that's the struggle, that's the tension, and that's, that's what this book answers. And I think I probably speak for you guys as well. When I read this book for the very first time, it was like, click it just it made mm. it brought clarity to that issue that every one of us at some point um, are asking um, so I don't know Joe you want to just talk a little bit about divine sovereignty and what does that mean um, I can sure I thought you were going to say something else in your name wasn't but I can do that well, I just, yeah we can just do it okay. um, yeah sovereignty is just you know God's in control of evangelism he chooses all those um, before the foundations of the world who are going to be saved and um in the strictest sense, only those who are elect will be saved. You know, and and as Todd talked about, you know, hyper Calvinist view may say that, uh, well, if that's the case, then what's the point of even doing evangelism because they're going to be saved anyways. You know, um, so we struggle with that. If God is completely sovereign, then why, you know, as Todd said, why even evangelize? But um, there's a there's a, a thin line that. Um, um, Spurgeon says, 
this this line of divine sovereignty and human responsibility it's it's so parallel that we may not see see it here on earth but it, it meets at the foot of the cross so even though God is sovereign in salvation in, in everything we as human beings we still have a responsibility um, to trust in Christ so yeah even to back it up even further from that the doctrine of God's sovereignty is to say that God has sovereignly determined everything mm. that ever occurs in human history he he is sovereign over the universe he is sovereign over the path of stars he is sovereign over nations rulers kings he is sovereign over the animal kingdom he's sovereign over the um, sea life he's sovereign over every molecule in our body there's nothing that takes place in the world in the universe that is outside of the sovereignty of God so I mean that's ultimately what we're talking about which then of course includes as Joe well explained the fact that uh, God determines whom he saves on the basis of his electing sovereign purposes. Mm -hmm. And that's Ephesians 1.11, is he works all things after the counsel of his will, and that verse is in the context of the doctrine of salvation. So does God elect people? Absolutely. Does God save people on the basis of his sovereign decrees? Absolutely. Can anyone be saved outside of those decrees? Absolutely not. So the doctrine of God's sovereignty, you know, uh, explains the fact why people become believers. They become believers because God has sovereignly ordained that. And I think what's key to recognize in that discussion is that both faith and repentance are gifts of God's sovereign grace mm. to the elect. So you see that all over in Scripture, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, um, says that faith is a gift. It is a gift of God and that not from yourselves referring to the faith itself. Faith is a gift. God gifts faith to the elect so that they can believe. Um, repentance is a gift. God gifts repentance. Uh, Acts 11 verse 18 says that uh, God has granted to the Gentiles repentance leading to life. Uh, same thing in 2 Timothy 2 verse 25. Uh, God gifts faith and repentance to his elect. So that's his decree and that's his grace to do that. Um, and so um, we'll talk a little bit more about the evangelistic side, but I thought maybe if I could just take a minute to look at some passages where where the doctrine of God's sovereignty actually collides with the need for people to believe the gospel. So the doctrine of God's sovereignty does not negate human responsibility. Mm -hmm. uh, it actually works hand in hand, and Packer called that an antinomy. Um, antinomy meaning when you bring two apparent truths together uh, two truths together and they apparently contradict each other they actually don't contradict each other they're actually true and Joe you said it well that in our mind it's hard to comprehend how that happens but these uh, realities which seem to be contradictions are not actually contradictions uh, they are truths uh, which um, are, are both true and we have to hold them together so very quickly just some key passages that bring together the sovereignty of God and human responsibility. One of those would be John 1, 12 and 13. As many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. So here's divine, or here's human responsibility. You need to believe in Christ, you need to receive Christ. And then verse 13 says, who were born not of blood, but uh, nor of the will of the flesh, but of the will of, uh, nor the will of man, but of God. So there's, right in the very next verse, you have human, I'm sorry, you have divine sovereignty. So two verses, back to back, one emphasizing human responsibility, one emphasizing divine sovereignty. Come over to John chapter 3, and you've got the same tension. I mean, every one of us knows and loves John 3.16. Mm -hmm. uh, whoever you know believes in him should not perish. For God did not send the uh, Son into the world to judge the world, but to save them through him. He who believes in him is not judged. So is the gospel open to anybody? Absolutely, to anyone who believes believes but what is the first part of John chapter 3 about it's about Nicodemus right it's about this man who was hopelessly lost he needed salvation and what does God tell him God tells him you must be born again which Nicodemus had no power over that's divine sovereignty and then you come over to John chapter 6 and you see this antinomy played out in a number of places oh. let me just give you a couple of examples <clears throat> um, John 6 verse 47 says, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. It's open to anyone who believes. Uh, but then just three verses before that, John 6 44, Jesus also says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last day. That's divine sovereignty. 
Um, same thing over at the end of the chapter, John 6, verse 64. Uh, there are some who do not believe. Jesus doesn't rebuke the multitudes because they were not elect. He rebukes them for their failure to believe. And then verse 65, he says, uh, I have said to you, no one can come to me unless it has been granted him from the Father. So you have in a number of locations in the scriptures these uh, places where divine sovereignty and human responsibility collide. And Jesus never sought to reconcile those differences. Mm -hmm. He just taught both of them. They're both true. You need to believe the gospel, and God elects whom he's going to save and does so in his sovereignty. So you mentioned Spurgeon earlier. Spurgeon also said, I never try to reconcile friends. <laughs> Meaning if, the, if you're friends, if you've got two people that are agreeing to be friends, they're compatible, they're, they're together, you don't need to reconcile them. What's the idea here? You don't need to reconcile these two truths. So you have to be willing to and content to let these truths lie. Um, even though they apparently contradict each other, in the mind of God, they, they never do. So, anyway, Joe, uh, I th more thoughts. I think that's so, all those passages you read are so um, refreshing to see that he mentions one right after the other. And, I mean, you see it in the Matthew 11, 28, when he says, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. But right before that, he says, Thank you, Father, that you did not reveal this um, to the wise, but to, to those. And then he says, only those whom the Father wills will come to me. So right there again, he says there's divine sovereignty. Right after it, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden. Mm -hmm. So it's just, it's so good to see that he does that all, all the time, and he doesn't try to reconcile and yeah. apologize for it. Yeah. So it's so good. Yeah, I think it's important, and Todd, you said this, um, but I, I think when we hear somebody say, well, there's a contradiction in the Bible, and we have to make sure we understand that there's a, there's a, the, phrase apparent contradiction because technically antinomy is a contradiction between conclusions which seem equally logical reasonable and necessary what J.I. Packer said was and I said it and I had it in here he said an appearance of contradiction mm -hmm. between and mm -hmm. so when we when we read scripture and we talk to people and you say you know you have your Arminian friend who's dead set on you got to raise your hand because it contradicts in the Bible you'd say well it's an apparent contradiction so you don't have you're not on the defensive so when somebody comes and asks you that um, you don't have to say, well, man, I, you're right, there is a contradiction. Let's figure out why this is here. Well, it's an apparent contradiction. Um, so make sure you're using your terms. And then the the other thing that you said, um, which I really like, and, and Packer says this really well, he says, we, uh, how do we uh, accept this or live with this apparent antinomy? He said, accept it for what it is and learn to live with it. That's <laughs> like... How concise! Like it is what it is. Jesus didn't try to didn't try to back it up. He didn't say, "Okay, guys, sit down. I'm going to explain to you the difference between divine sovereignty and the responsibility of man, and here's how it works." No, he preached the gospel. He condemned them for not believing, and he moved on to the next people group. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's the problem, though. <clears throat> Most people don't want to accept both of them. Yeah. Right. Right. It, in our human minds, we want to make sense of this. Yes. We, we want to be able to put this all together and make it be some sort of completely understandable, uh, rational explanation. And so we're not content to let it lie there. And that's why you have the two extremes. Mm -hmm. yeah. You have hyper-Calvinists on one side who swing the pendulum that far, and then you have the Arminians on the other side who swing it all the way over there because we don't like the tension. And part of wrestling through theology is being willing to live with tensions, mm -hmm. theological tensions. Mm -hmm. And honestly, those should be there because if we can figure everything out, hmm. yeah. God's not God, and we are closer to God than we think we ought to admit. That's right. Right. So part of this should be uh, part of our struggle in trying to understand these things because God is so far above us. There ought to be mysteries that we can't fully reconcile. Yeah. yeah, and you know where this can get really dangerous is when it moves from issues that maybe aren't um, you know, first level issues to something like the Trinity, where then a lot of like cults. I don't want to maybe be specific, but sometimes they'll come to your door, you know. <laughs> and um, which ones are you thinking? Not yeah. specific. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. There's only a couple I options. I don't know. There. <laughs> it's Christian scientists, no, <laughs> but they um, they're they're like that. They're so I'm just saying generally, we can be so um, frustrated with Jesus can't be the Son of God and God. He's not. They they have to make sense of it, so they just say, well, he's not God. He, he's just a created man, you know. And trying to 
that they're going to reconcile something that doesn't need to be reconciled. And that's where it can get really dangerous when it comes to those types of things. Yeah, and we can emphasize one characteristic or one attribute of God above the other, and that's how you get Arminianism. Because they say God can't love somebody unless they give them a choice. Mm. That's not found anywhere in Scripture, by the way. Right. Um, and so what we'll say is God is love, and so then we take our human concept of love, which we say choice is the highest form of love. I choose my wife, so I love her. She chose me. So that's the highest form of love. Then we take that and we put it over God, and so and then we ignore the doctrines that are there. So we just have to be careful of those things. Mm. Uh, and so then we have divine sovereignty. We have divine sovereignty and human responsibility, not free will, but human responsibility. And then we also have then what is evangelism. So mm. what is a uh, joke you want to enlighten us yeah. in three minutes or less? Okay. <clears throat> well, let me just quickly tell you what evangelism is not, because I think over the last 40 years, you have these ideas of what maybe evangelism is, and I think it stems from a fear of doing true evangelism. And, and you know, sharing your testimony, it's a wonderful thing. But that's not sharing the gospel. That's sharing your testimony. Unless you include the gospel in that testimony, don't be deceived and think you're sharing the gospel with somebody if you're sharing your testimony. Or inviting someone to church. That's a great thing, but that's not sharing the gospel. Maybe hear the gospel at church, maybe. But you're not sharing the gospel, just inviting somebody to church. Or some people say, well, I prayed for this person, and they think they shared the gospel with them. You didn't share the gospel with them, you prayed for them. Or the last one I hear a lot is, I'm just trying to live a holy life. Well, definitely, we want to live a holy life, but that's not sharing the gospel. The gospel, it, the, the literal word for gospel in the Greek is good news. Euangelio. That's, that's the good news. And the, the evangelism is the verb form. It's doing the good news. So it's sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when you do that, uh, you can't just share um, you know, that Jesus died for your sins. You have to, first of all, talk about sin. You have to show people their need for the good news before you, you just share the good news. So, um, you know, Galatians 3.24 says, the law of God is our schoolmaster that leads us to Christ. So, when we're sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, we have to first show people their need for Christ. Uh, we go, you know, law to the proud and grace to the humble. So, we, we show them their need for Christ. We use the law for that. And once they're broken, they see their need and their desperate condition, then we share the good news. We show them the grace of Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection. So, um, you know, I guess... So, let me ask you this. Then, in light of this discussion okay. on divine sovereignty, what is a correct gospel presentation in light of the doctrine of election, divine sovereignty? Okay. What What is the proper, then, gospel that needs to be communicated in the understanding that is God who has sovereignly mm -hmm. elected everyone? Well, you just, there's just a few things you need to include. I mean, I don't, I don't like giving just a canned presentation, but you just have to make sure you talk about the holiness of God, um, God's holiness and his sovereignty, the sinfulness of man, um, the, explain the substitutionary nature because of your sinfulness and God's holiness. You can't be together, so ex explain the, the nature of his substitution, and then the need for repentance and, and trust in Christ. And so those are the basics that you have to include in your presentation. The holiness of God, sinfulness of man, the nature of the penal substitutionary atonement, or the, the atonement work of Christ, what it did, what, you know, how it, it fixes that broken relationship between a holy God and a sinful man, and then the need for repentance and trust in Christ. Do you think you can say, God died for your sins? You could, but... Or Jesus died, for, not God, Jesus died for your sins. Can you say to every single person, Oh, I see. Jesus saying. died for your sins. No, you can't no, say you it can't as say a single that. person. Because that, I mean, that's the typical gospel presentation. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Jesus died on the cross for your sins. Mm -hmm. What's, what may be being careful theologically, what's the issue there? We have limited atonement, right? Okay. okay. If he died for um, everybody's sins, then everybody would be sick. Unless, or else his death wasn't sufficient. Well, God's a monster and he's punishing people twice. Okay. So then, what is a correct way to communicate? In the back of our minds, knowing God elects, mm -hmm. God sovereignly chooses who He's going to redeem. What's the proper way to communicate that and phrase that then? To communicate that He didn't die for everybody. Is what you're saying? Well, I just think we need to be careful. We need right. to say something to the effect that if you believe and place right. your faith and trust, then yes. Christ's death is efficacious for you. 
right? Yeah, and, and you're part of the elect, or you're part of the union. You'll be saved if you mm -hmm. embrace the Lord, Lord and Savior. Yeah, so I think that the, the stipulation is there must be repentance and faith and trust in Christ, um, or there's no, you're not saved. You're not, that, 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 that work of um, salvation doesn't apply to you if there's no repentance and trust in right. Christ. Now, I would say repentance isn't a work that saves you, but if repentance hasn't taken place, salvation hasn't taken place. So that's a key because people will say to me, well, now you're saying repentance is a work. You've got to repent to be saved. I'm saying that if you're saved, you will have repented. So it's not something you do to get saved, but if it hasn't happened, you're not saved. So do you say repentance is a fruit? It's a fruit, yes, of salvation. Like God was saying, every part of it is a gift of God. Every single part of it. We, without, you know, we can't do it, any of it. But we're still responsible for coming to Him. So, I mean, there's so much there we could to, to talk about. So then we'll, uh, <clears throat> we'll end with divine sovereignty and evangelism. Because here's the question, and, um, you know, our, our, our presentation is good and we can share the gospel and we can call people to repentance. I mean, you see it in Scripture. You must repent and believe from Jesus to Paul to Peter to all, all throughout the New Testament. Um, but how do you then, how, how can you then um, say, okay, you need to go out and preach the gospel to people who God's already divinely, uh, sovereignly elected to save? And that's the question, because you have hyper-Calvinism, which says God's going to save who he saves. We're just here to live out the earth. And you have Arminianism that says, Hey, if we can get 30,000 people in the stadium, get them all to raise their hand, they're all good to go, and then get there next next weekend, next weekend. So in the last couple minutes here, um, how do we reconcile uh, How do we reconcile this? Well, I think we have to understand that, yes, God elects those who he's going to save, but he also has ordained the means by which that salvation occurs. Mm. So God always works through means. I mean, he can work outside of means, and he does in the Old Testament at times, he, you know, sovereignly causes things to occur. But in the case of evangelism, God works through vehicles by which that truth is communicated and the gospel is presented. So uh, God is going to bring the gospel to somebody through the faithful preaching, witness, evangelistic effort of, of people. So we can't negate the evangelistic endeavor by just believing in divine sovereignty. Mm -hmm. So in other words... It's the means. Evangelism is the means by which God accomplishes His will of saving people according to His divine purposes. And just to add to that, I believe, contrary to Arminians, I believe that the doctrine of election is the greatest impetus for evangelism. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because Arminians have zero confidence that God's going to save anybody. They're just out sharing, and it's great, great. I don't want to minimize the fact that they're trying to see people come to know Christ and they're sharing the gospel. That's great, that's wonderful, but they don't have any confidence that anyone's necessarily going to come to faith in Christ. Mm -hmm. What is it that guarantees that someone's going to come to faith in Christ? It's the sovereign grace of God that overpowers the wicked human heart in regeneration according to his sovereign electing purposes that draws that sinner to himself, and that is the guarantee that we have that our evangelistic effort will succeed. So. Yeah, and I would just add also, we have to be sure that we have the right message when we are sharing the gospel because our technique and all these other things, they may be great, but here's what Romans 1.16 says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation. So the gospel is the power. So make sure you're sharing the correct gospel. That's where the power of salvation comes from, in sharing the correct message, not in doing it this way or that way. People have told me before, I don't like the way you do it. Well, how are you doing it? And they're not doing it. And a lot of people that say that to me. Well, if you're not doing it, you know, you're not. You have to be have the correct message and sharing the true gospel message because that's where the power for salvation comes from. How have you seen this, Bob? Just to, the doctrine; these two issues collide. How have you seen this in your own ministry over in Africa? Maybe how have you seen divine sovereignty and? Uh, human evangelistic effort. Well, it's actually going to ask you guys a question, so you beat me. Um, <laughs> but, uh, no, that, that's a good question. You know, we've been part of, uh, we've been part of crusades, and I, and I, I will tell you, um, one of the saddest things uh, that, that we were part of was an evangelistic outreach 
uh, for all the churches in, in East Africa or in the city we were in. And, um, you know, if you showed up and you raised your hand, you got a Bible. And so they would hand out Bibles. Well, then the majority of those people took those Bibles, sold them on the street. They showed up the next night, raised their hand again, and they got the Bible. And then they go out and they sell it on the street. And this was a three-night event. And so they came the next night, which was the third night, raised their hand, got a Bible, sold that again. That same person, now here's what the American church has done. Here's the, the dark side of the American church nobody wants to talk to, uh, talk about. Um, those churches that were hosting that from the states, a dozen churches or so, they all counted that guy three times as being saved, oh, wow. and then they go back to their church, and they stand in front of their church, and they say, we preach the gospel faithfully, you know, it's by faith, and, and then they say, we had 560 people on the first night, 700 people on the second night, 800 people on the third night. You know, meanwhile, A, the majority of those people were definitely not saved. Um, and B, the majority of those people were the majority of those people again and again and again. So seeing it played out like that, um, obviously it's put a very bad taste in my mouth for uh, big evangelistic outreaches. Uh, and so I think the, the sharing of the gospel, I love sitting down with somebody and I love being able just to share the gospel with them. Um, and uh, I think we need to take advantage of the time that we live in. And the time that we live in, there's a lot of people that don't have hope. Maybe your family members, maybe your friends, co-workers, whomever, and you have the opportunity to offer them hope, like a real, actual, tangible hope that lies outside of all the craziness that's going on right now. And so a lot of people, when they think evangelism, they think Billy Graham, Lee Slaw, you know, whomever that, that is there, Chris Tomlin's big conferences or concerts, and uh, that's, not, that's not what we're called to in Scripture. We're called to be able to witness to one another. And so um, I'll kind of end with this, you know, uh, you know, uh, Kevin DeYoung asked this question once about tithing, and I kind of related to everything in Bible and, and Scripture. And he, it, Kevin DeYoung said, "What if everyone tithed like you? Where would the church be?" Mm -hmm. And so my question would be, "What if everyone shared the gospel like you? Where would the church be?" Um, and we're not saying you have to, uh, you know, uh, hold an event at your house and invite your neighbors over and put the podium in your living room and then start giving the, the gospel. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, you know, when was the last time you just shared Christ with somebody? When was the last time you shared the hope of the gospel as the, you know, the power of God unto salvation? Um, do you guys have anything you want to add? You good? Okay. Get this book. Get this book and read it. Excellent, excellent book. So if you've never read it, uh, at least uh, pick up a copy and read it sometime. You'll be greatly blessed by it. Yeah. So you guys have a wonderful rest of the day and uh, hope to see you on Sunday.